Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix online meeting 239. Just after July 4th, hope everyone's doing well. This meeting is recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. If you are here, go ahead and say hey, hi. Jacob and Ron have said hi. It's great having you guys with us as usual. We're missing a Zach this week, but maybe he'll see him next week. Uh, we got our sound issues all worked out. We are going to attempt something today that I don't know that we've attempted to do on this meeting, at least not in a long time. I'm getting ahead of myself. Say hi. We're going to do triage. We're going to go through the issues that we have open, and then we're going to try to do this uh, Windows sandbox with integration test uh, thing and see if that works out. The work that Bob has been doing that we've hinted at for a couple of weeks now uh, hopefully it, uh, all goes well, cause we're going to do it. We're going to do it live. But before that triage, Bob, ready? I'm ready. Triage. Woo. Four issues. One of them I brought back. One is from other people and Sean brought two. So let's go ahead and start at the beginning. Um, Light XE failing to build in Team City using merge modules. I think this is tracked down to their antivirus was having problems yeah. or is creating problems. Um, and then he decided he's going to go try to do rebuild it with some changes inside Wix and he wanted to do his own build. Um, do we need a retry here somewhere in four? Is that probably the thing to take away from this issue? Yeah, that's why I left it open. Um, if so, the the right work here. in four to use intermediate folders correctly, um, I think is is a big win uh, yes. for this. But even that, it requires that you, uh, you know, have the ability to turn off virus scanning on on particular folders, um, and you know, that's not always feasible because sometimes IT people get power hungry. All right. In general, I think a lot of IO should have retries. I yeah. Mean, so this I, was... I, I'm not entirely sure here what um, needs retrying, but... It's the open database call on the merge module. Yeah. I mean, sure. It's the database we're merging into, I think, too. So... Right. Uh, yeah, that's probably a reasonable thing to do. File load exception. Hmm. Okay. That's a useful exception. All right. Uh, you can send this my way. This is kind of in my area. I'll, I'll go ahead and add a retry around this thing. Okay. It'll be another one that we do. Right. Cool. Next. Uh, remote payloads prefers local files even with hash mismatch. Uh, whoops, did I jump? No. Where's mine? Oh, ah, all right. You guys talk about this while I go and find my issue that I wanted to put in triage. That I'm, did I? All right, I'll let you guys talk about this. Uh, Sean, you're well aware of this one. In fact, you duped it and then said it's not quite a dupe, I think. Yeah, so... Like this was the case where you have like you download the bundle to your downloads folder and then in your downloads folder you also have like the VC readist downloaded, but it's the wrong one according to the bundle that you're trying to run. So the bundle is gonna try to use that one that's sitting in your downloads folder, even if it doesn't match the one in the bundle. Yeah, this is this is one of the weakest parts of Burns caching. I say that because you fixed a lot of the other weaker parts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly how we want to do that yeah. because theoretically when the BA gets the message that that happened, the BA could do something and like try to re-download it or something. So it's not necessarily true that that file path is definitely bad, but probably 99% of the time it is bad and we shouldn't try it again. Yeah. The hash is wrong, yeah. 
I mean, I don't know. Because basically this guy wants him to go to switch from the local file to download. And that basically means either the engine or the BA is going to have to just give up on the local paths. Did the, did a, cause it used to be that you couldn't get into this loop. Can the BA at least get in here now? Yeah, the BA can, the BA will get the first, uh, resolving and the BA is just like rubber stamping the engines, what the engine picked basically, which is the I first mean, time, which is what they should do generally. So that makes sense. And then, you know, verification fails. And then at that point, the BA has to say retry on the payload. And then it'll loop back around. And then the BA is going to have to know that it's mm -hmm. the previous path failed somehow. So the BA is going to have to, like, start keeping state on what are the paths that have been tried before. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the file's there. It's just not the right file. And for Jacob's question, if the bad file is in the package cache, then burn will just delete it. Yeah, that uh, bad file should not be there. The, so the, the thing is that we don't doesn't that, happen. Yeah, we don't. Scenario. We don't do a hash verification of the file outside of the cache. That would be one way of solving it is if we hash the file that's outside the cache and say, oh, yeah, that file's not the right one. You don't want it. You don't want that one. The problem is hashing that file uh, could be really bad, especially if it's all like on a network share. It could be really slow if it's really big, all kinds of different problems. Um, now, I will point out that I did have to change the scenario a little bit because today in 4, it will check the file size before, like if it's verifying it by hash, right. then if the file size is wrong, it'll ignore that path when it's trying to figure out which path to pick. Because that's an easy thing to check. So that, that's definitely a win in four. So and that's why you point out if the file size is correct, right? Or if there are yeah. thin code verifications. Um, why does the file size not matter when Authentico checking? Because we can't trust it. We don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, right. Could have been swapped out. Could have been swapped out with another thing that's been the right Authentico. Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah, this is basically a, yeah, your BA has to handle this problem. Or the engine has to do more work. Can a BA tell that it's explicitly authored as a remote payload? It doesn't matter if it's remote or not. Well, I'm, I was suggesting I'm, that it does matter because if the bundle was authored um, with a remote payload, then it's reasonable. Well, it would be reasonable even to not check for local files. No, because remote payload just means that you don't have the files during build. You can build an image. That, that's, but that's why I asked. Is there a way for the BA to tell that it was explicitly authored as a remote payload? If the answer is yes, then there are some yeah, options. We could, we could not look for local files at all, or second, we could immediately give up if we, don't, if we aren't given the correct one. So I, I, we can't, even if, I don't think they know that it's remote payload. Or not? Okay. It just turns no good. And and also just to clarify, I don't think that we could stop or that we could ignore the local files, because the um, remote payload means you don't have the files at build, but you could put them into like the CD image by hand later. Sure, sure. So in that case, you would want well, it, it to check local, even though they were remote payloads in the source code. Sure, sure. I'm just suggesting if it were a remote payload, then it's trivial to because we also have to support a layout, right? So it would be trivial yep. to just say, okay, you get one chance and we will not retry file again. If it's a remote payload 
the bundle author is expressing oh. an intent to always download it. So uh, yeah, yeah, you don't have payload. to retry. I mean, again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm speaking from a lack of detail, detailed knowledge of of the resolution callback. Does does the BA know that it failed to validate because it, of an incorrect hash, or is it more general than that? That was a question for okay. Sean. <laughs> well, I mean, for the, for the world, why does it matter if it? I mean, the verification failed, so it can't use it. But if it knew if it was a hash verification and it knew that it was a local file, it would know that it's not that file. That that yeah, yeah. It, that would but, eliminate that file pretty rapidly. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just looking for shortcuts. But Sean, you're right. It, it failed. So, um, you know, if if it fails the the first time or maybe a second, if you want to do a retry, just because we're talking retries today. If there's a download URL, you switch to that, right? Yeah. I mean, theoretically, it could have been... Like, there's a lot of different local paths that can be considered. Really? So, well, you next the bundle to failed, but it could use something else. The CD. It's kind of a weird case if you're in the downloads folder, but... <laughs> yeah. Chances are you're going to use a download URL. And I guess theoretically, Burn could like keep track of how many times that has tried this path and like pass that to the BA. And then if the BA sees something greater than one, it could just always like switch to download. Or we could send the count for each different type, and it could pick the min of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I, I, I've tried files five times and I've tried downloads four times. I will try download again. Uh, <laughs> um, I think but, we're getting a little overly complex. But I, I, it, it, So the only thing I don't want to happen is for a layout to fail. Um, you know, it, it should be possible using layout to get an entirely offline experience. If you tried to fake a layout and separately downloaded the wrong prereq. No, no, that's not going to work. Yeah, no, the you... problem here is more that they downloaded into the downloads folder. There was another yeah. file with the correct name, and yeah. they got unlucky. It's it's in a it's a bad attempt at DLL hijacking. Right. Um, Sean, what if what if it just sent the last uh uh download type or uh, resolve type it had where the initial call there'd be none and then it would say hey last time you did this you did it with file or hey last time you did this it was you know you attempted download yeah we could do that that we should, pro should probably pass the path as well the path is oh that's true Right. Yeah, if we had that. I was trying to do it even minimal. But yeah, that would be great. The more information we have is probably worth it at this time to essentially have the BA have to remember less. That That's what we're trying to do there. Yeah. Uh, that's probably... Because I don't think the engine can get can solve this problem completely. No. I see. And now I understand the remote payload. Yeah, remote payload doesn't... Okay, I see. Ha, ha, ha. That name is still not a good name. Okay. Um, do we want to take that in for? Oh, wait, Jacob. I think I've seen this before, the field where someone did a layout with version X and a few months later downloaded version one to do that. Yes, Sean, Jacob, that... <laughs> Jacob, that's a very good way to get into this problem, is to do a layout download a new version and attempt to lay out to the same location. Um, lots of file names are the same, but they're not, all the files are not correct. And then all kinds of havoc breaks loose from there. Yep. Yeah, I can do this in four. 
I think a little more information will just make it easier for the BA. It still pushes a problem to the BA, but at least the BA will have a bit more information. Yeah, it was really... I liked in 4 that you didn't have to code your BA to return download anymore, but... Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's no way around that. Yeah, not in these edge cases that could happen. So, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Uh, we good here? This is going to Sean to try to help BAs a little bit more. Yep, yep. Okay. Refresh. Mine's gonna pop to the top, haha. <laughs> all right, uh, Sean, do you wanna do yours first or you wanna do mine next? I'll let you choose because I slipped in at the last minute here. Uh, I think mine's pretty simple. <laughs> okay, uh, well then we'll just keep going. Add standard variable name validation to searches and set variable. Okay. Yeah, we just need to add validation. This is in the... Oh, this is both in the core and in util. Yep. Cool. Who's going to do it? Oh, wait, Jacob. That's the... Oh, Jacob had another, uh, uh, I'm, we'll finish this day first. Um, who's, who's doing this? <laughs> oh man, come on, not me. I mean, I mean, I guess I can do it. I didn't really want to. <laughs> I have so many. Um, I'll take it if it's, I'll take it. It's not, standard variables are already out there somewhere, right? And they just need to be available during the compile time. And then available to searches and set variable, or at searches. I'm sure they're available internal. Yeah, it's about it, making it available to extensions, and then using it as well for set variable. Fine, fine. I'll take it. Uh, add ability to specify the custom action reference depends on architecture. Yeah, this is about the UI extension mainly. Where it, oh wait, so Jacob's asking, how do you propose to validate this validate standard? I assume he doesn't mean STD um, versus custom. Uh, there's a list of known variables, right? That's what this is about. Well, I mean, this is also blocking the Wix prefix. Yeah, right, and the one where we can hide things. So, like, you're specifying the variable that's gonna get the results of the search. So you can't specify a built-in variable for that because you can't overwrite the value. We're essentially trying to save you a runtime failure. Yeah. Correct. This actually is it's the other not, way around, it's... Jacob. <laughs> the case we're worried about here is the other way around. If they try to use or misspell their custom variable and use a standard variable, then that's what we want to block. Uh, yeah, most standard variables start with Wix. Right. Except for like the MSI clones, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Jacob just had it the other way around. He's good. All right. Um, Sean, this is yours. I'll let you. I, I don't need to read it. You can give the summary or whatever, the executive thing. Or maybe Bob can, because he summarized it here. Asking for the ability to reference a custom act. Why am I reading this? Someone else do this one. I'm I mean, going to take a drink of water. The it, bottom it, part is like. If we just kept quiet, he would have kept going. <laughs> the UI extension is currently using that plain name, Wix UI Validate Path, in its dialogues. And a lot of people are just going to copy that WXS file. So we want to keep it to where it it looks clean like that and without any preprocessor variables to make it work to reference the right architecture. But there's no way to do that today because that value that you that string you put in there is going to reference a custom action. And then if you have multiple custom actions with that same name, then you're going to get a duplicate symbol error, I think. Yeah. So we're trying to add something to where we can solve this issue. 
Yeah, so basically the UI extension is the weirdest one of the of the extensions when it comes to custom actions because several, a couple, I think there are two, um, uh, two custom actions are referenced as do action control events. Um, and those are baked into the Wix libs. So the, the approach I took was to at compile time, when you reference a, a dialog set, because again, to do this, I needed, needed an extension. Um, so now there's a compiler extension that parses your, your UI reference. Um, and I basically, based on the architecture at compile time, plug in the correct uh, custom action DLL reference, really. Which is weird and bad, but uh, again, going, something I blogged about last year was now in Wix 4, at compile time, we know the target of the package, target architecture of the package. Um, so it's kind of in line with the rest of the the custom action work. Uh, it's just because of the do action, I had to take a, you know, I had to go in through the back. So. Is there an idea how this works? I mean, I thought maybe just add an attribute saying, like, very smart architecture or something. And then before linking, it would append, like, underscore x86 or whatever, if it was the target was x86. Or in, I, in, oh, go ahead. I guess at compile time, it could do that. <laughs> But it would have to be in the Wix compiler, not in the extension. Right, right. So, to an extent, I think this is like an example of of stuff we've talked about for like Wix five, mm -hmm. where some of these things can be, you know, essentially magical. Um, we kind of already had that with you know program files sixty four thirty two folder, mm -hmm. um, where you know just based on the target architecture, we know what has to happen. Uh, it does require, you know, either intimate knowledge, like program files folder, um, or it requires a pattern, like, you know, the suffix uh, for certain IDs. Mm -hmm. This is just a, a specific instance of the problem. Yeah, I, I think, I think we should move this to Wix 5. I think we should tackle this holistically because there, this is part of that holistic problem yep. that we're, we've got to, that we have not done much in 4 on, that we've talked about being a pain point to go solve in a better way. And we'll just have this pain point. And this is new in 4? Well, it, it's new because... We have architecture-specific custom actions. Right. Before, we only had x86. Right, right. And we relied on emulation, which works fine on x86, x64, and ARM, specifically ARM32 worked. Um, ARM64, it still works, right? But, you know, we were doing architecture-specific custom actions, yeah, yeah. so. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think this, I mean... One option would be to push for these that stick out like this, that great, we could keep the x86 ones without any prefix or suffix on them. Mm -hmm. That would be one way to kind of sneak by it. But honestly, we can dock this. I th probably need to dock this at the very least in four and include this uh, in the 
hopefully Wix 5 feature that tackles architecture holistically. Sorry, what needs documentation? Um, if they if you if you if customize, you to, yeah. If you want to avoid including the custom action DLL, you're gonna have to use UI ref for the ones that don't need it. I mean, that was like the, the pressing issue that made me create the issue is that people are gonna start having bigger MSIs because they have an extra DLL that they don't need. No, that's not true. There's no there's no change in that in that behavior between three and four. If you use Wix UI, you got the Wix UI CA DLL. I forget what it's named. And if you don't, if you use UI ref with one that requires it, you're not gonna get a build time failure, I don't think. Well, that's why when I moved the UI ref to the extension and I added it to Wixcop. Right now you can't use UI ref. I agree. That's that's a change. But that change is covered with with Wix convert. Sorry, Wix convert. Otherwise you were still getting the the UI custom action DLL in three with all of the uh, all of the UI libraries included it. Yeah, but if you customized it so that it didn't use it, then it wouldn't bring it in. Um, yeah, that's fair. But at that point, you could use UI ref. The only reason it's in the compi in the UI extension is to handle these custom action DLLs. I'm not refusing to dock it. I'm just you know I don't this, I don't think this is a real this isn't a breaking change. No, no, I, I wasn't thinking breaking change. I was thinking doc as in if you're customizing the Wix UI uh, using UI ref. Like it's the whole doc that we have on copying these things and changing UI ref and so on and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. Then if you want this custom action, being able to refer to it correctly because you won't presumably have the extension to no, well, fix it up. No, you. You, you and Sean are saying two different things. If you want to continue to use the custom actions, do nothing. That continues to work as is. Sean's saying if you modified the dialogues to remove all reference to the custom actions, now using the compiler, the UI extension, compiler extension would always bring those in. And that's true. That is a change in behavior. I see. It's not breaking, but it's a change in behavior. So Wix five, I think so. I, I I think this is a good thing to definitely catalog under the architecture theme. We haven't sat down and said what the themes for Wix five were. Gosh, I sound like a PM. Um, the what does Scrum call it? The epic? The fee, I don't know. Whatever the name is, the the overarching feature that is continue to improve architecture. We've done baby steps in four. There is a bigger architecture improvement. Um, Archi uh, platform architecture handling for this across the Wix tool set, aka. Well, you're talking about the difference between the internals and the externals, externally visible, because we've done more, way more than baby steps in before when it comes to the internals, internal architecture. Yeah, that 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 that's fair, but it's making it. Yeah, it's like, but still, the way util, uh, not util, the way all the extensions bring in their custom actions with the whole suffix and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. With the include file, like oh, like, it's horrible. Yeah, solve, yeah. No, solve. We need that. We need a that. holistic approach. Exactly. Solve that kind of. That's one of the pieces that at the bottom I see. Like solve that. Solve it for components uh, and the identifiers. Like there's a whole lot of things that all go to that to make it work well from the bottom. Mm -hmm. up. So, and this I think is one more case that I probably would not have thought of. Of you know, hey, here's a do action that refers to it. You're like, oh gosh, yeah, the UI can jump into these things. This is another one that I don't want us to lose. Yep, I will take it to document it in V4 and then keep it around for V5. Yep, and we need to, or I need to spend some time looking at all these new features in GitHub to organize your issues for releases, which they've been doing. Yep. 
Um, cause we will do that, but we're not talking about Wix 5 right now. Cause I know if I got down there, I'll end up in a bottom of a rabbit hole where I'll just be thinking, I really just need to go fix my Wix 4 bugs. Speaking of that, um, I was working on this yesterday on my stream, uh, remote payload for payload elements and things were going well until, uh, all right. I think I updated the wrong issue or didn't save it somewhere. Um, until I hit. Uh, a ref problem. So, supporting remote payloads or support, so XE packages and MSUs and uh, what's the other one? Uh, anyway, bundle. bundle can all be marked as remote payloads. Okay, you don't have to have them available for the build. You can, we can gather all the information up and put it into your Wix code, and it's called the remote payload feature, so that those things are available or off somewhere else in your world, and we will be able to build with the hashes or the certificates and all that kind of stuff. What you can't do right now is have inside that as well the list of payloads that those things may depend on uh, that you don't have available right here right now, and it'd be nice to be able to uh, take the same thing. In this case, they're talking about SQL 2014, but it could be anything where there's lots of loose files that need to be listed. All right, great. That's the root of it. This is very straightforward to include the payload element with the necessary attributes to make it remote, namely the hash and, and or the certificate information size, things like that, underneath a where you define the XE package or the bundle or the MSU. Probably not MSUs. I think they're almost always single file. But uh, it's easy to do that. And I would argue probably the 80 to 90% case will solve. Uh, that will solve the 80% or 90 case. You will have a XE package with N number of loose payloads. In the case of SQL Server 2014, it's about 2,000. So you have 2,000 lines, all that. Boom. You'll put that off into a fragment somewhere and you'll just use it when you need it. All right, so the issue comes if you wanted to take those 2000 payloads and organize them into separate fragments with like payload groups or things like that, then you'd like take some hundred and say these, let's put this in payload group A, some number and put in payload group B, so on and so forth. And then go back to that XE package and refer to that payload group. That would work. It could work, just pull the payload groups. They have all the hash information, the linker and everything will pull all back together. Everything's fine. The issue is if you include, uh, the issue is that we do not want to allow payloads to be remote when they are used as part of the bootstrapper application or as part of the new bundle extensions and burn because burn will not do a download of a payload or go acquire a payload from somewhere else. Uh, just before it then launches the UI. All those files have to be inside the bundle, ready to go, namely in the UX container, um, all contained inside uh, the bundle, ready to go. So you cannot do remote payloads for bootstrapper application files or bundle extension files. The problem is you can put a payload group under bootstrap applications or a payload group underneath bundle extensions and then pull in those payloads from somewhere else. And that fragment could be in a separate file, in a Wixlib, whatever, which means we won't know that you had a payload group that maybe had remote payloads in it without their file paths, referring off with hashes and whatever to files that are out there somewhere until bind time, which means we would end up getting remote payloads into the bundle, the bootstrap application. So there are two solutions to prevent the use of remote payloads in uh, bootstrap applications uh, and bundle extensions. The easy one is to say payload groups cannot contain remote payloads. You cannot define remote payloads uh, in a payload group because we don't know how you're going to use that payload group. Are you going to use it in a case where remote payloads are allowed or not allowed? We don't know. Therefore, remote payloads are not allowed inside a payload group. That's the easy solution. The more complex solution is go to the uh, back end, the burn back end, and have it verify when it's looking at all the payloads and say, hey, this payload is going to end up inside the bundle application, or the bootstrap application, therefore, and it's a remote payload, and it has to error at that point. And that's a bit more complex. So I bring this issue here to say, which way do we think 
can we do the easy way? Can I do the easy way? Because I'm implementing this. Can I do the easy way? Or do we think it's important to do the more complex way? And I brought this because I think the easy way is the way it's going to work because generally you you um, will use the remote payload burn subcommand to generate all of this uh, source code. So I don't think this scenario happens very often that you'll have payload groups to, to find remote payloads. But I want to bring it here if People here thought that it was, no, that's a really important scenario that I will then go do all the extra work in the binder. So there's my long soliloquy. Basically get to vote one way or the other. Or a third option if I didn't think of something else. Uh, there, there is a third option. What's the third option? Create a separate payload group element. Oh, for... <laughs> a remote payload group that allows payloads to... Uh, no, uh... So well, you're right. There's I, a third I, option. It's another. I meant to restrict it to the bootstrap application payloads. Or okay. Then, I but... see. So you, a, a bootstrap application payload group. Yeah. Something like that. Mm. So uh, I, I, I'm confused. It's not clear to me why the back end has to do anything other than look at the payload. The back end is assembling the, the UX container. True. So when it goes to assemble the UX container and it has a payload that has no source file, isn't that a simple error? Well, it probably doesn't handle it today. But sure, but I mean, adding that it's here. I'm I'm confused about your your statements of. Uh, of you're saying complexity. that it's probably going to be easier than I think it is. That's <laughs> it's entirely possible. Yes, it's, which is again a, a reversal for the, our normal <laughs> states, but <laughs> but at, I mean, it's literally at the point of creating the UX cab. It, it seems at that point, if there's no file name, then just nah. True. It, it pushes the error all the way to the back end. Again, <laughs> it probably shouldn't happen that often. Introducing another element, like Sean says, could prevent that. I'm not... I, I, I'm, I'm less and less... I don't care... I, I don't care about the early error messages anymore. Uh, you know, speaking of Wix 5, I want the Wix 5 compiler to be nothing. <laughs> well, it, I want the I uh, want it to just be extremely straightforward, and everything else is, is link time code gen or bind time code gen. So I, I'm not concerned about the the timing of the error message. The timing of the error, because again, it's it, well. First of all, it would have to be post link anyway, right? So yeah, it's in it's the like, back end. Is, is is it? Yeah, you know, eh, I. Even if it's literally at the point of, well, we're creating cabs now, uh, that's fine. The only downside, of course, is that you may have gone through hashing and a whole lot of other things in a large bundle. Well, but... now you know better. <laughs> I, I, but, but the point still stands. It's not like it's likely to happen very often. Agreed. It's just not the way people are going to organize this code. Yeah, because it's going to work fine for the, for the use case in the, in the issue. The only time it's a problem is if someone does this really weirdly, right? Well, they do uh, extra organization, and I, I, I mean, it, well, but it's extra organization just for a BA or a bundle extension, and then trying to put remote payloads in them. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you're generally you're not including many files. In those anyway, right? I mean, your the output of your of your BA. Yeah, you you wouldn't want to. It it just seems unlikely that this is going to be the the specific problem of of you know the BA getting these. It's just yeah, no, that's really low. So I've I've already added a lot of validation like this in four already. Just in case so things slip through. I don't think it's might. a big deal to add this one. All right. The does it need a special? All right, but maybe a special error message too. Although 
Now, I guess it's just going to come back to saying you needed a source on this thing. Remote payload not allowed here. But yeah, I don't even know if it has to say remote payload. You really can't say source file attribute is required. <laughs> yeah, it just comes down to source file attributes required. Sure. And then sure. that's basically like, yeah, your payload source file is messed up. Although that's a compiler error message right there. Yeah, well, and and as we get into these binder error messages, I'm finding myself in more and more situations where I'm referring to the original element or trying to refer to the original element by name to point them to their source code that they need to fix. Right. And sometimes it's not, you can't know exactly, uh, well, it was this element or this element is one of these two that got you here. Yeah, um, we have line numbers. And then a line number, yes. The line number Good is hunting. the thing. Yes, this line number. As long as you didn't put everything on one line, you're probably okay. But yeah, see, <laughs> and again, I'm okay with punishing people who would do that. Yeah, I don't know anybody that chooses to put all their XML on one line. See, all right, maybe this is way less of a thing than I thought it was, and I was just kind of driving me crazy. All right, cool. I will go or do it. Or hard... Sean and I have convinced you to take the harder path. <laughs> yes, that's entirely possible. All right, I will I will take the harder path. It is definitely harder because the easy path is very easy. Um, <laughs> but uh, we will run down the harder path and see where it goes, where it leads. All right, I don't need to spend more time on that. I think that is triage. These all get triage labels removed. Whoa, look at that. Bob is on top of it. Uh, nothing more to triage today. That leads us to uh, the exciting part of today. Uh, Windows Sandbox with, for the integration text with the you're trying to use the integration tests inside the Windows Sandbox. Um, and this is a limited demo time. So I'm going to try to do this demo <laughs> and we're going to do this and Bob's going to try to help me set up my machine to run these things and we're going to see how well it works. Right? Yep. All right, here we go. All right, so we're flowing back to my computer now. Uh, let's make this bigger. Um, so I have a build of Wix 4 that I just completed here and I can just leave this here, right, Bob? Yeah. So I have this repository that of content that Bob sent me here, and I am going to open this up. And Bob, what's next? Well, you can look at the README, oh. uh, because the README is actually oh my goodness. Well, started out as a blog post, and will be a blog post when I'm completely done. Um, but it walks you through basically. There are you know, three functional files in uh, this repo that control uh, the configuration of the sandbox. That's your XML file, or I'm sorry, it, it is an XML file with a WSB extension. Um, there is a batch file that runs inside the sandbox that actually installs the .NET SDK because the Wix tests require it and then uh, executes uh, the tests using the aforementioned SDK. Um, the third batch file, and now I'm trying to remember if that's the order I described them in my blog post, but whatever, um, is the thing that actually runs the sandbox. Um, first, it copies the, uh, the Wix output, all the integration tests, into the directory where the sandbox is going to mirror it, share it inside the VM. So you have to manually change that as Rob is doing right now. And that line is describes where the, the sandbox, the shared sandbox VM will live, or sorry, the shared folder where the sandbox will live. Now I just put it into the same directory where I created the that GitHub repo. So here. Like that. 
uh, it can be any directory. I mean, with this, you're going to lose the sandbox every build. So for every build there, then I don't lose it every build. Yep. Yep. And it's tucked away inside the same place where I build Wix. Okay. That's perfectly reasonable. Okay. Um, although, what? For, what? So it's. Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to see if you're you're doing things differently, which I can you know, put it is, on the root if you prefer. No, no, it's it's. Where did you clone this this repo? Right here. D colon Lexcode Wix four. That's where my repo is that I'm working on. No, no, sorry, my 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 repo. Oh, this repo is in D Lexcode Wix sandbox. Okay, use that. Okay. Because that's how I have mine set up. That makes sense to me, too. Okay, great. Yep. I got it now. This makes sense to me. We so. don't want to taunt the demo gods. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. All right, so I need to change this here, then? Host folder. Yep. You want to change the value of host folder to that whole path. Like that. That looks right. And this command I changed? No, that's inside. Oh, nope. So it maps that, nope. and there the rest of it's the same. That is the only thing you have to change. <laughs> okay. Or those are the only three things you have to change. Okay. Um, um, you can look in the other uh, batch file. But that doesn't require any changes, because everything is now... This is the batch file that runs inside the sandbox. All right, you said I needed an SDK, I remember. Correct. Um, you do need a, a .NET SDK. Um, I actually spent a little time saying, ooh, I can, I can just download it. And then I'm like, oh, I need another batch file or PowerShell script, and PowerShell is evil, so I didn't want to go through that. Um, but if you go to back to the README, um, the, that link right there, or the orange text indicating a link, um, you can yeah follow that that one. Go to the definition of that link and open that in a handy browser. And I want the SDK. Yes, you want the SDK for Windows X64. Great. And where do I want it to be put? I want it to be put in the root of the cloned repo. Okay here okay oh dang it where are my downloads downloads save us all right okay i have downloaded that file i hope yes i have a dotnet sdk now okay that looks amazingly similar to mine. I am afraid to run this batch file. All right. Well, you've, you've, you've looked at it. You know it's not you know malware yeah. of any kind. And yeah. That, I'm... And that batch file is running inside, it's the, inside the sandbox. sandbox so, yeah, so it I, could do I, anything. Yeah. I care less about what it does. Exactly. Presumably. Yeah, all <laughs> so all, all it does is copies. It copies the build into the shared folder with the sandbox so the sandbox has access to it okay. and then it kicks off the sandbox. Okay. And then I'm just doing a couple of row copies to get files from here to here. Yep. All right. So <laughs> do we do this? Do we run it? It's your machine. <sighs> no, I mean, it's perfectly safe. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Lots of copies. We. Lots of copies. And now it's starting up Sandbox on my other monitor. I'll bring it over. Sandbox boots up. And it's it's on the .NET SDK that I downloaded, which I mm -hmm. guess is the thing I saw it doing that batch file. Yep. All right, we'll let that go. All right. Now I thought the burn test required another runtime. Well, that might explain why I'm getting a couple of failing tests. Because it's testing the x86.NET Core BA, which requires an x86 runtime. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, so then... if you look at the README 
on the burn one, there's more prerequisites than in the MSI README. Okay. But this is cool. Like, here we are. It's at least starting them. Yeah, and here's the end-to-end -end test for Wix. Although these run as part of your normal build because they don't modify your machine, but... No, it's... these are the burn ones. Oh, no, those are burn ones. Right. You're right. These are the burn ones. The Wix yeah, this should only be the integration ones that require, you know, elevation and... Huh, huh. The special the run time into end tests. I guess uh, that's the difference. Yeah. Well, I noticed we're not terribly consistent with whether we call them integration tests or runtime tests. Well, I mean, there's an attribute on every single test that says runtime backed. Right. Yes. Right. So that's kind of what I'm talking about with the, okay. the runtime end to end tests. Yep. And you need to, you have to set an environment variable before they'll, also before they'll run, just as, you know, backup security. So normally what I do is, if you look at the run test command batch file that I have in the repo, I added the dash v normal so that it, it printed out the test that it was running as it runs. Because otherwise, you're just looking at this blank screen for 15 minutes. Oh, come on, this is great minutes. content here. <laughs> <laughs> it's compelling. Um, I'm using the run tests from the repo. Actually, this is weird because on my machine, I also get I, I get more than this. Why did they take that away? Task manager? Yes. Yep. So you're saying that it might actually be hung right now. I don't know. Uh, let's go to details. Oh, there's bundles running. Anything using CPU, though? Nothing interesting. Oh. Yeah. Well. Yeah. But we want to look the at test. the log right now? or? Oh, gosh. Are we debugging this here? All right. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I will. It's I up will, to you. I will. Uh, <laughs> I'm in command prompt. Okay. Well, let's see. What do we have here? We have, <laughs> we have the .NET's log file in here, and we have this first one. Oh, it's doing something. Failed to load library. Mm. Okay. This is. So, I'm running. These on Windows 10. Uh, okay. And, I'm on Windows 11. Yeah. And you've had you've you show the first thing that got me interested in using Sandbox for this is you were running a bundle test, right? Yes. And it failed, or at least noted in its log that it couldn't load something. Yeah. And so Sandbox would definitely inherit that if it's you know an OS thing. I broken something? <laughs> don't know. I don't know. However, this this I I mean the purpose of this was to kind of get an idea of hey, this kind of almost works sort of thing, limited demo. And Bob said that there were still things that weren't working. This is very cool. Uh it allows you to run the tests locally, assuming we can get past these things that prevent it from running inside the sandbox. Which Right, yeah. That's my, my goal in this. Well, one is just, it'd be, it's very handy. Sandbox is very handy. I love Sandbox. Um, it boots up extremely quickly. And the SDK, having to install the SDK is a pain, but it takes 10 seconds. So, you know, it's still, this is still faster than booting a full VM. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, it, this is, you know, we're still in the experimental phase. I mean, at a certain point, if it, if it works reliably, I happily, you know, include instructions in the, uh, you know, actual repo. And we know that burn three works in the sandbox because <laughs> .NET Core SDK install was with a burn. <laughs> so oh, that's, that's the, a good point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it, it it's not burn. It's just this burn, the one that I just built on my machine. Um, and it repros on other people that might say something about burn four. 
or something. But uh, this is very cool. Very, very, very cool. Going, I, I think that's the end of demo. Anything else to say about it, Bob? I, I, I think we're there. Works better on my machine. But, works better yeah. on your machine. It still doesn't work completely on your machine. It doesn't work. I can't say works on my machine. It works better on my machine. Yeah. So uh, we'll get to, let's see if I, if I end this process. The question is, did I get the right one? I did. I got the right one. Presumably the test is going to get upset at me now. Oh, it's going to run another one. And this one's going to hang. I was just trying to get it to come back and fail. Oh, wait. I yeah, think. it's going to try to uninstall it as part of cleanup. Yeah, I thought it, right, it's right. made it pretty far. I mean, it made it. It's some of the process have started, so I'll just kill us again and we get the test failed. There we go. And the test failed. So I mean it shows us working like as designed here. Now we just have to get all the bun burn working inside the sandbox. Or at least this sandbox. Maybe it works in other people's sandboxes. All right. Still, thank you, Bob. That this is very cool. Uh and I just I can kill it just by closing this, right? That's right. That's the other nice thing. Boom. Thank you. I have my machine back. Zoom. All right. Uh, so, oh, I forgot to bring my slides back. Slides. There we go. So, there's our limited demo. Bob said he's going to continue to kind of work on that, which I think is it's very cool. It's very promising. It has great hope for the futures. Other things people want to talk about. Other stuff going on out there. Anything happening? Going? Doing? Got to fill space? Let's see. Next meeting is in two weeks, two weeks from now. Um, quick update since it's two weeks from now. In 13 days, on July 20th, the .NET Foundation is having their first summit. They say there's going to be more of them, but this is the first one. Um, I've been asking them to do more for projects, and they've done it. So since I was asking them to do more for projects and they've done it, I decided I needed to do uh, something. So I uh, will be presenting about the Wix tool set in the summit. I am not talking about Wix 4. I am talking more about open source and the different ways that you can get involved in open source and using the Wix tool set as a case study. So if you want to come hang out, it's actually at the same time as my stream, my weekly stream. So that will be uh, July 20th, Wednesday at 12.30 PDT. I'm saying this now because I won't see all of you in this meeting um, then. But if you come by my weekly stream, I'll be talking about it this next week. Um, it will replace my weekly stream on that week. And I'll be talking about uh, a little bit of history of Wix and things like that. Uh, definitely not talking about features of Wix 4, stuff like that. Do not come to this thinking, ooh, I'm going to learn about the next things of Wix 4. That is not what this one is. .NET team uh, Foundation says they're going to do another one of these maybe in another quarter or so, and I will then maybe jump in that and talk about all the features of Wix 4 because then we will be mostly done. Knock on wood, please go, yay, do all those things. All right, uh, Ron said he wanted, oh, we want to talk about his pull request. That seems like a reasonable thing. Let's go pop up the pull request. Although I think... The pull request, we just had like pretty simple questions of. So what are we looking at on the pull request, Ron, that is not already in the pull request text? And let's see if I switch here. There's the pull request up to the top. Ron has gone through and changing the, I think it's just changing the debug preprocessor to end debug instead, uh, which is the opposite of the way that uh, Dietl was built and based. So it's kind of thing is that I think it's complete. Yes, but it's, uh, are you getting the questions here? The, the question is why switch to uh, end debug from debug? Because um, I, the whole thing depends on debug. That's why our, that's where I think all, the whole question is like all the code, as you probably noted, it all depends on debug. And so it's just a big switch to elsewhere. And that was the thing we, we were kind of waiting for an answer on. Yeah, I don't know if my brain can handle if and def and debug. It's too many double negatives. Well, I guess one double negative. Yeah, it's just not it's just not standard at all inside 
Deedle and all the code that's built on it, which essentially is all of the Wix tool set after that. So it's a it's a it's essentially not just a change in the existing code, it's a change in the way that all code from now on has to be written. Can't use some of the log features. There's no consistency in the use of debug. It should be very consistent. I can't use some of the log features. Which features? I'm not aware, I, I don't know what doesn't work. And there's no consistency in the use of debug. Well, debug should only be used for debug code. I, I don't expect there's a lot of it out there. I mean, we can look at like files changed, but right. So this flips it. So no longer define debug, only defined not debug. That takes it out of the global world, sets it globally. What's this one? CS project. Oh, okay. Whoa, CS project gets to switch too. This changes all CS project code too. But that's and debug is okay. This is very different. I don't understand. This is just flipping the the two. Defined in some places where it would be necessary, but it's defined globally in the. It's defined in the same place as end debug is here. Either it's defined or it's not defined. And if it's not defined, it's not debug. And if it's not defined in a debug context, then that would be interesting to understand. Like maybe we missed one, but that's what these. We shouldn't be missing them. That's what these areas should be in these props files and this targets file. Interesting, this is in the targets file. I guess it has to be late. That must be what it is. Hmm. So I, 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 I just don't understand the motivation to switch everything from using the debug to end debug. And then there's some test code down here. The debug code is dimmed. Okay, I don't know about what VS is showing in these cases. That could just be VS not fully embracing the directory props and targets. Yeah, I mean... But actually, that we know they don't embrace directory props and targets because um, uh, if you try to put the toolset version in a props file in a directory props file VS says oh do you want to upgrade your targets or upgrade your project because it isn't looking up to find those settings so th this isn't so much using end debug explicitly it's not using debug so that the the right preprocessor variables are set inside the Visual Studio context, so that you debug would never be true. Yeah, I, I I'm. Uh, the the. <laughs> The whole, this is all backward. I mean, there should be less debug code. It should be things. Yeah, so, yeah, all right. All right, I think I understand now what the issue is. The issue is how the code gets presented inside Visual Studio, not how it works in the, in the end. Everything is working as is expected. The issue is just how it's presented inside Visual Studio. So I'm gonna go look at that and see that I'm not, I'm not 100% sure I'm thrilled about changing all of this just for the presentation inside Visual Studio. I, but I'm, I'm also not sure that I'd want that presentation either because the debug code is less important than the release code. And you don't ever you know, debug and release. So anyway, uh, let me, I'll try bringing it up in Visual Studio. I'll try pulling the PR down and looking at it in Visual Studio and, and seeing the difference between them. But now I understand that this is all about how it's presented inside Visual Studio. There wasn't actually a problem where things weren't 
that were supposed to be debug aren't debug. It's a functional issue as well. All right. So, Rock, can you put the cases where it's uh, the where the functionality was busted? Because that's the thing that we're missing. We've we've looked at it. We didn't see any the functional changes where it was broken. So let, let's go ahead and look at those, and then uh, we will go from there. Yeah, some concrete examples would help. Yeah. Because right now the only changes is all the same thing, just flipped. I feel like in burn, the presentation is correct. If I'm in debug build configuration inside of Visual Studio, then the stuff is dimmed correctly. Well, also, I'm wondering if, because I know like for the Wix projects, um, you know, in V3, they don't support uh, directory props. So um, it's possible that we just have some lingering preprocessor defines that, you know, light up correctly. Also, remember, you know, this is pretty clearly a bug in Visual Studio. It's entirely possible that at some point they'll, you know, fix the bug and go, oh, yeah, directory props now work. Or maybe they already have. Then Sean is on the later build that has it. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. Well, that's Tuesday it's of always next week. So. All right, and so and yeah, you don't have to find all the issues, Ron. But, but some of the cases that you're like, these are the cases this is fixing. That will be helpful. Uh, that will be the interesting thing to understand. Okay. Anything else? Other things? Ron's going to go find an example or two of things where this end debug fixes the issue where debug was uh, not the, a good choice. Otherwise, I think we're back in two weeks. Um, no, no, Ron, just put your, just respond on the pull request answering the questions that are on there. That, that That's fine. Because then we'll all be tied to the pull request. We'll be like, oh, okay, these are the cases that where this fixes problems. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks. I th think every, that seems very normal. Uh, the day after the .NET Foundation Summit. Uh, same time, 9.30 PDT. And same place right here on this stream. Until then, you guys all take it easy. We'll be back in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.